but we'll get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to first and foremost, Happy New Year. I know we are about 35 days into 2021, but Lens was taking a break, and this is our first Lens um, into 2021, and we're very excited to have um, Professor Raja Shar be our guest, our very first guest of the new year. So thank you, Raja, for being here. Um, we are very excited um, and uh, very excited for those who are going to be attending her talk, um, which is titled Purpose Driven Practice, Design at the Intersection of Identity and Passion. A little bit about our guest today. She is the Program Director and Assistant Professor of Product Design at Drexel University. Um, she's also, uh, she also co-chairs IDSA's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council. She's an industrial designer with an extensive background in museum exhi exhibit design and healthcare design, who is passionate about ways design can make a positive impact on society at the intersection of health, equity, the environment, justice, and STEM education. Going to let Raja talk a little bit more about the work that she does and um, a little housekeeping rules for those who are tuning in. Um, if you have any questions, please ask them in the Q&A. Highly encourage you so that we can uh, integrate that into our conversation. And the, with that being said, Professor Shar, the floor is all yours. Thanks so much, Hector. Um, hi, everyone that's here. Nice to see you. Um, I know that it is a Thursday night for many of you. It's right around dinner time. So it's so great um, to see people showing up. Um, it's been a long day for me, so I appreciate you all being here. I know that these are recorded, so I'm glad people will be able to watch later if they choose to. Um, but welcome and thank you for welcoming me. I am going to get started sharing my screen in just a second. Hi, Danielle. Um, and then, hi, Henry. Um, so um, I'm going to start sharing my screen in just a second, but I just wanted to sort of give you guys a little bit of a preview of how I'm going to sort of structure my portion of this talk. And I know that we're gonna have a long Q&A session afterwards, um, but I am going to sort of be going a little bit over a little bit about me. And I don't know how many people know me that well, um, but I, I'm going to talk about myself. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story, um, but I'm hoping that the story that I tell has you reflect on yourself and your own experience. I'll also be going over a little bit about the work I do and the way I approach design um, in my program. Um, but I'm really excited about tonight. And I'm with that, no, without further ado, I'm going to get going on my full screen mode. And I am actually probably not going to be paying attention very much to what's happening on the chat because I've noticed that when I go full screen, I got to kind of move you all out of the way. And I'm trying to figure out how to do that. Minimized. All right. So let's get it. You'll have to bear with me. This is what my students have to do all the time. Um, I kind of apologize, but kind of not. Um, so, okay, you can all see my screen. Yes, you're good to go. All right, cool. All right, everyone, welcome. Um, so tonight, this talk is called Purpose Driven Practice. Is designed at the intersection of identity and passion. Um, thanks for having me. I'm Raja Shar, as Hector's already said. So, hi, hello. First thing I'm going to ask you um, is, hi, how are you? So, if everyone can just tell me how they're feeling in the chat, I do this with my students. They hate it, um, but someone please interact with me just a little bit so I have a sense of how you are doing um, this evening. Um, I do an after school program on Tuesday nights and I make all the, we make all the girls um, go through and give us an expression, um, a physical manifestation of how they're feeling that day. And sometimes we're feeling low, sometimes we're feeling high. 
we have a lot of very energetic people. I'm not gonna make you, since I can't see you, do anything in the camera, um, but if you could at least put a word in and tell us how you're feeling, that'd be great. We got people that are tired, people that are excited, people that are exhausted, yes, yes, yes. Hungry, also, I have a burrito waiting for me after this that is definitely getting cold. Um, more people that are excited, yay! Oh, overwhelmed. Oh my gosh. Can we talk about that a little bit? Because I feel like people that tend to be very passionate about things put a lot of work on themselves and we're always stressed out. Okay. So anyway, I'd be doing too much. Um, motivated. Awesome. Um, better after a snack. I would love to know your snack, Kayla. Um, like a feeling glad about being here. Yay. That'd be awesome. All right, so for me, um, I just think, how am I feeling today? I think I'm discombobulated, but I always am. So that's pretty normal. My computer crashed right before I had to get on this call. So I lost a bunch of slides. Um, that said, I recovered because I'm used to doing things last minute. So, you know, it is what it is. Ooh, sharp cheddar, so good. Okay, I'm gonna have to check those out. All right, so nice to meet you. So let me tell you a little bit about me. So hi, I'm, I'm Raja. Um, I am a fan of donuts. Um, for, so for those of you that know me personally, you know that this is a huge passion of mine. If you could see my office behind me, right over here, there is a neon powered donut sign that is being powered by a solar charger made by one of my former students, um, Christopher Sode. So yeah, and then um, these are mini donuts. This is from a trip I took to San Francisco um, when I got a bucket of donuts and tried to eat all of them by myself. Um, I am a huge fan of fried dough. I honestly anticipated by now I would have a book on how fried dough is the great connector across the world because most cultures have some version of frying um, a flour or starch based thing. And a lot of people have it as a dessert item, right? Or something that's sweet or with syrup or soaked, be it, you know, churros or um, anyway, long story short, donuts are my thing. I love them. I grew up eating them. Um, I grew up making them. I make them now. I have really upped my donut game over the course of the pandemic. Everybody else was making sourdough. I was making donuts. Um, I'm also a big fan of design. I am a designer. I'm an industrial designer. I am probably um, one of those industrial design professors that never really talks about my own work, but I do work. I design museum exhibitions. Um, I've been doing it for a very long time. I actually started off doing interaction design um, and then moved into museums um, as an undergrad, actually as an intern at the High Museum of Art. I went to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago for grad school, and I do um, experiential graphic and environmental graphic design. Um, it is what I do. It's it's fun. I love it. It's very important um, to me being part of my practice. I continue to do it to this day, um, but it's not my passion, which is interesting, right? But I do love design. I also really love um, social justice. And social justice as it relates to health, as it relates to race, as it relates to gender, as it relates to the environment. And I think that I this comes from my deep appreciation and love of society and humanity, even though there are definitely times that I don't like people that much because people can be trash, but I do want to improve the world. So I, and I do think that there's a better way for us to approach it. So this is actually, these are photos from like my life. So this is photos from protests I went to with my kids um, not too long ago. Um, and I also am a huge, huge fan of the future. Um, so you might be thinking about the future as like robots and cyborgs and space travel. And I also think of it that way, but I also try to imagine like who is in power in the future. So after today, and what does society look like? Um, and is it a place that I wanna live? And you know, people often reflect on like, do I wanna bring children into this world? Um, and I, I am optimistic for the future cautiously. I like to call myself a doomsday optimist. So I am always ready for the end of the world, but I'm hoping that it's far away. Um, and so I'm a big fan of thinking about speculation 
um, in conceptual design and getting ready for what's next. Um, and so I try to think that I'm always prepared um, and I'm ready to go. So this is a button that I also have. Um, so I am currently, my role in life is I am the program director for product design at Drexel University, where I am also an assistant professor. I do research on health education equity through looking primarily at understanding those equities through the lenses of black women. Um, and additionally, I also focus on projects that deal with bio-inspired design and sustainability. Um, these are a few of my students and some of my faculty. Um, and we are, we are one big family. Um, I, before I came to Drexel, I was actually teaching at Georgia Tech. I graduated from there in 2001 and I taught at Georgia Tech for a long time. And it's my alma mater and it's great. And what it really cements to me is that I love, 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 love my students. Because when I went through Georgia Tech as an undergrad, um, it was one of the most eye-opening and hardest experiences that I ever went through. And so I have a really deep appreciation for the students that, that go through that pro those programs, as well as any other college or university. Um, and I, the last four years, I actually taught in the biomedical engineering program as a, as a um, design instructor. And I um, co-managed the machine shop with my friend Marty. Um, and we had a great time. And what I loved is I loved the students. I loved how hard they worked. Um, and that was super important to me is because I wanted to understand what drove them and what made them love what they did, no matter how hard it was. And so I kind of feel like I run or teach design with sort of like three knowns, right? Um, the act of designing and the process of designing can be very hard, right? See if this goes to the next one. It's not going to the next one. Come on, Vance. Here we go. Um, it can also be very collaborative, but it can also be very fun, right? But the purpose of design um, is to think about how we could change the world. And that can be done for better or for worse because design ultimately is a power. So I kind of wanted to um, pause for a second here and talk a little bit about how I came to design before I get into sort of like the meat of my talk. So if you'll bear with me, making sure I don't, I have, I put down some talking points to make sure I don't go over time um, because I only have like 15 minutes left. So I'm gonna try to be quick. Um, so the first thing is when I introduced myself just now, I was really talking more about what I do and the things that I love to do. And when you see me here on the screen, and when we talk about this notion of like identity, we usually are talking about attributes that we assign to people that we use to describe them. And oftentimes they're either related to like their position in life, like what's their job, like what do they do? Um, maybe who's in their family. Um, maybe if you can see them, you might be making an assumption on their gender across the spectrum. Um, so how do they present? Um, oftentimes we're looking at the possibly their skin tone or features and we're trying to discern a race, right? But there's obviously, these are like physical attributes. And we have people that have job titles and we have people that look a certain way, um, but we don't really know who they are as an identity. Like how do they identify themselves? Right, and identity can be really complex, right? So if you looked at me and you said, okay, she's a college professor, um, she's a designer. Uh, it seems like maybe if I was really um, paying attention, I might be able to detect where she's from um, by maybe her voice or accent. So you might assume I'm American. Um, if you were assumed I was a Southern American, you're very correct. Um, you might assume that I'm a cisgendered woman you might also assume that I have excellent taste in Zoom backgrounds. Um, and you would not be wrong. These are all true, right? But if you probably don't know is that I'm also the mother of two kids. I have been raising and living with dogs since I was a baby. I have two poodle mixes. Um, my husband is a high school science teacher who teaches robotics. And so um, we talk a lot about the making of things. Um, I also am a transplant to the Northeast. So I'm a Southerner at heart who got up here and hates the snow, except the last couple of days have been kind of fun. Um, and then 
the other thing is you probably don't know that I went to grad school in Chicago. And I, the only reason that I left that city is because I'm a wimp and I can't live in the snow. Right. And these are all like just interesting curiosities about me, but they give you a little bit more insight into who I am and how I might be experiencing my life now. So I, now that I, you know, that I'm a transplant, you probably know that I'm also really missing my family and all my friends who are back down in Georgia, especially during this pandemic. Um, you also probably can get glean now that if I'm working from home, as most of us are with two young kids and two dogs, it can be a little bit hectic and stressful. Um, you might imagine that if I'm married to a high school educator, he's also living a very stressed out, always on Zoom life, trying to get things to work. So there's a little bit more about my background. But the other thing that you probably could not discern is like how I, I am where I am today, because you probably don't see a lot of people who look like me on the screen. And I think Advance has done a really great job at really curating a diverse panel of speakers for all their different events with lens, context, et cetera. And so I honestly think that if you're following along with Advance, you probably have an idea of what the design um, industry looks like from a demographic standpoint that is not really true in reality. But if the, you haven't been following along, you've just been looking out, you probably are really sort of like surprised to see someone who was a cisgendered black woman who was from the American South sitting up here on your Zoom screen. So I think that's really important for you to understand is like the way, the reason I got here is completely by accident. Um, and so it is not because I was always groomed to be a designer, but I have always wanted to be one. But the, one of the reasons that I'm really surprised that I'm here today is I didn't know what design was I just knew how to do it. And I think that that's something that a lot of us can probably um, empathize with in terms of our approach and how we got to this field is it's something innate in us, this wanting to create, this wanting to change things, this having a consideration for the way things operate and look that we wanna have some control over. And so I actually, didn't know what it was, but I felt like it was something that I always did. And I also didn't get here by accident because I grew up in a community in the deep south in Valdosta, Georgia. And I was in a community filled with very smart, very powerful black women in my family, um, in my, my family, my extended family, my parents' friends, um, you know, everyone, my, my doctor was a woman of color, immigrant woman of color, right? So for me, I grew up in this bubble where I had amazing role models, amazing support, and I have family that was super focused on diversity in education. Um, I grew up in a diverse Muslim community in South Georgia, which gave me a lot of exposure to um, all the international students that would come to the university there. Um, and my parents would adopt them. And so they would be in my home cooking. So I learned how to cook food from all over the world, like at age eight, nine, and 10. I learned how to read different languages because they would, I would sit and be tutored. Um, it was a really fun experience for me um, as a child. And so I've always had sort of like an eye tuned to what else is happening in the world. The other thing is that I was really privileged to be smart enough in school that my parents insisted that I um, go through gifted education. And I think that this is super important because one of my really big beefs about traditional education is it's not experiential learning. Um, but if you have the privilege, if you're in a public school, um, and you can maybe make it into an enrichment program or gifted education program. My parents do so that I got tested, I got into this program um, and I was able to do project-based learning. And so that was, and if you think about it, everyone should do project-based learning. Everybody should be doing things hands-on. Every day should be a field trip exploring the world. I mean, we had days where we're just picking up like rocks in the, in the, on the playground. Um, and I loved it. We would go to the cemetery and do rubbings on things, right? And so I learned a way of um, going through school that wasn't just about tests and worksheets. It was really about playing and discovering. We also had this competition called um, Invent America. This is back in the 80s, so I don't know if anyone else is around, but it was it's coming up with ideas, creating prototypes, it was science fair style, but you would essentially pitching designs, but they call them inventions, right? I loved this competition. I had so many great designs. My parents still have friends that are like, remember that thing that Raja came up with in fourth grade? I saw it on TV. So like this was like the competition for kids that were just like, I want to change the world, I want to do something. 
but they never called it design, right? Um, I was also frequently in those classes, the only black kid. And that's something that's really important to how I navigate the world today, because it's one of those first times I actually learned how to quote unquote code switch. Um, so I learned how to act in these classes that were full of white kids. And I also learned how to go back to my other classroom, which was in a 50%, 50% um, town. So the, the schools were half and half black and white primarily, a few Asian kids in there, but not, not a lot, right? So it's really a town that's mostly black and white and it's sort of divided along these black and white lines. And so when I got to go to these classes, I was often the only kid that happened to be the black kid which I think is super important for people to understand that that experience of being in this class where I got to play, I also noticed that I was the only black kid in this class that got to play, play through, learn through playing, right? And that's something where I feel like that's the first time I noticed what un un unjust like learning was like. It was this thing that was palpable to me that it wasn't fair that I got to do this and my friends in my other class didn't get to do it. I thought everyone should have the chance to do it. But I was also coached to be very vocal about my opinions. And so I brought this up frequently. And so in, one, in some ways, it's like, I love this idea of playing through learning. I'm learning through playing. I loved to make things and design. I loved exploring the world. And then I realized that being in this situation gave me the perspective of understanding that it was a privilege for me to be in this room and not because I was that much smarter than my classmates, but because my parents had pushed for me to be in this class and I was tested where I was not, would not have been tested at all had they not done this, right? Why isn't everybody else's classes, your parents pushing them? So it was, I was in that class by myself as the only black kid for a long, long time until about fifth grade um, when Troy Calhoun got in the class and I was so excited to see the black kid, yay! And then I eventually ended up going into high school. And can I just tell you that the kids that were in the gifted class, you would think those would be the only smart kids like going through high school, the same town. By the time I got to high school, I was surrounded by brilliant black girls, like so freaking smart and amazing. And they were never in those classes with me. And that was one of the other things that was really frustrating is like you didn't know that people were smart because you were only told you were smart if you were in this special class. Um, and I think that's really important for people to understand that when we talk about this idea of privilege and how it, you get to where you are, there are so many other things that happen along the way. The experiences that you have, the relationships that you build in your family, in your community, that you have, the things that you experience in your classroom that are going to actually push you um, in certain directions or nurture you or expose you to certain things. And there's so many people that had they known about this thing called design um, that would have been where we are today, where I am today, um, that they just didn't know about it, never were nurtured that way, never were really told about it. And the reason I'm telling you this is because I feel like it's my race, my gender, my religion and my community, my family relationships that really teach me how to see the world as a designer. Um, but the other thing that I wanted to point out before I move on to this next thing is that I spent a lot of time with my great grandmother growing up as well. So I also got to absorb nearly like a century of firsthand accounts of the American South. So like I sat on her front porch listening to stories about lynchings that she witnessed, um, presidents, tra train travel, um, losing her only daughter in childhood birth, which also gave open my eyes to the plight of black women, some maternal health. Um, I also got to growing up in the South experience and learn how to move past like overt racial insults, but also microaggressions, right? Um, I learned how to take advantage of all sorts of things, um, including my ADD brain. Um, and then it's also taught me how to stand in my own like skin as a ner black nerd, because I have eventually decided to reclaim that probably like in eighth grade, I was like, screw it. I don't care if I'm ever gonna be cool. I'm always gonna le learn nerdy things. I'm always gonna love stuff. So um, I want you to kind of get this picture of this kind of nerdy black kid who grew up in the South, um, who knew about the world outside of Valdosta, Georgia. Um, I was really excited about it. 
and had this sense of who she wanted to be. But when you grow up in the American South, nobody tells you about industrial design. What I was told was, it sounds like if you're good at math and science, you might be good as an engineer. And so that's what I attempted to do. So I went to Georgia Tech as an engineering student and eventually found industrial design. And we are where we are today. Um, but because I wasn't sheltered from the evils of the world, it's one of the things that influenced everything about my schooling then and then how I teach school now. Right. And I it's one of those things where I never want to shelter my kids or my students from the fact that there is design is a gift that we have. It's a power that we have, but it can also be destructive. And we also have to be aware of the inequities that it presents once it's pushed out to the world. Um, and I also want people to also understand that there's some things about um, design that can be liberating in a, in a big way. Um, and the other thing that I think is really important for us to understand as well is how we can think about design from the perspective of students who don't know about it that really need to understand about it. And I'm, I'm not going to transition to the meat of my talk now. And one is to think about how we can reach students or how we can reach creative people in the world where they are. So the next thing I'm going to talk to you about is my love of TV. <laughs> which is a weird transition, but this is super important. So I love all those things. I have all these experiences. Um, but when you're a kid growing up in the South without the internet, remember this is in the 80s and 90s, um, TV is my outlet. I love TV so much that when I was asked to do a TED talk, I hemmed and hawed and said no for years. And then finally I said, yes. And they said, what are you gonna talk about? I said, I'm gonna talk about TV. <laughs> Why do I love TV? Well, TV is stories. TV is stories about the future. They're also lessons from the past, right? But they're imaginings and retellings of stories that are so important to how we can see the world and how we see ourselves in the world. Um, and so let's admit, most stories that we see, read, write, whatever, on TV and all that stuff, they're about white men, right? So fine. They're about old white men, young white men, punk white men, criminals, all of them, right? Uh, doctors, lawyers, detectives that are white men, poor white men, rich white men, artists, superheroes, villains, inventors, and security guards. They're about strong white men, weak white men, bald white men, and robotic white men. So what's interesting is I'm having this conversation with my husband, who is a white man, and I was like, oh my God. Can you believe that this guy who's a white guy, and I forget my husband's a white guy, he said that white men are misunderstood. He's like, well, we kind of are. And I was like, how are you misunderstood? My entire life for the last 40 years, all I've heard about is white men. I watch a lot of stories about white men. I can tell you about yourself if you grew up and you wanted to run away to the woods in Alaska. I can tell you, I, I know, I know, I know your stories. I was like, for you to stand here and say that you're misunderstood, it's complete bullshit. So let's move on to the next thing. All right, so the reason I love TV so much is not because I get tired of seeing stories of white men. I do love those. It's because I get to see little glimpses of parts of myself that are so exciting to me. So here is one of the shows that I was introduced to by my parents. My parents are also black nerds and my mom is a Trekkie. And so she, my, she grew up watching Star Trek. So Star Trek, her favorite show to this day, my, my kids love it because I watch it with their grandmother, right? Um, this is a really important show in American history. Back in the 1960s, Gene Roddenberry created this show, created this cast, created this colorblind casting that happened to include this woman. You all know who she is, Michelle Nichols. If you don't know who she is, if you're not a Trekkie, if you haven't really seen it, it's okay, I'm gonna tell you about her. So Nichelle Nichols um, played um, Lieutenant Commander Uhura. So she was a commander or part of the command crew of the Star Trek Enterprise, which is a, what do they call it? Uh, it's like, it's not a war craft. It's like a dignitary craft that's like exploring the galaxy trying to make contact with other species and planets to understand them and to also as ambassadors of earth 
tell them what earth is like. Like that's their purpose in life is to travel around, right? So she's on this on this thing. Um, with, why is okra important? So Uhura is important to me, but she's important to, uh, to a lot of people. Nichelle Nichols is also on my background right now, if you don't notice. Okay, so Nichelle Nichols, Uhura, it was an actress. She loved musical theater growing up, right? So her passion was musical theater. She gets cast. She does a couple of a season or two of Star Trek, and then she gets offered a role in the musical theater. So she goes to Gene Roddenberry and she quits. She's like, I'm thanks so much for this opportunity. This is a great show, but I'm gonna go do this, this musical. And he's like, You can't quit the same day or the same night. She goes to an NAACP event. So she's submitted her letter of resignation. She's resignation. She's quit Star Trek. She shows up at this NAACP dinner. Um, and someone says, um, Miss Nichols, your greatest fan wants to come over and say hi to you. And so lo and behold, it's Martin Luther King Jr. So he tells her what a big fan of the show he is. It's the only show that he and his family watch religiously. They let their kids stay up late. They don't have to go to bed. They watch it and they watch it because of her. And she's like, oh, thank you so much, but I'm quitting. And he's like, you can't quit. <laughs> Do you not know what you mean to black people in America? Seeing you 300 years in the future as part of this crew, not as a black woman, just as a scientist, like out in space, doing your job, being in charge of shit, being a badass with a really amazing hair, by the way, um, is so important to what we're struggling for right now. This is during the civil rights movement that this conversation is happening because people are being beaten and protesting on the streets to fight for the rights to be where you are 300 years from now on this show. You have to stay. So because Martin Luther King asked her to stay, she decided to stay. So she stayed on the show, that's really important, but she didn't just stay on the show. Because of the, the reason she stayed, not because it was her passion, her passion was musical theater. She stayed on the show because her purpose in life was to influence other black kids, people of color, women, to can pursue careers in science, technology, engineering, and math. And that is why I think when I talk about this idea of like identity and you have your passions, there's an intersection between that and like what your purpose is. And her role was more important than all those other, so the cast, a, a, lot of, a lot of not black women, right? We got, we do have over here, George Takei, right? Which is great. Um, but for the most part, we have a cast full of white men, a crew full of white men, a lot of other white people in costumes are on this show. But Nichelle Nichols, because of her identity was really significant to being on this show and influence generations of people in science. And so for me, TV is that outlet. It allows me to not only dream and see myself, but it also feel like it can really influence other people. And so media, popular culture, um, science fiction, especially, it's something that I try to weave a lot into like the projects that I do and also the way that I operate, because this idea of not just TV as a pastime, but TV as a way to mine and to think and to conceptualize um, and the thought that goes into it. So I'm gonna run through real quick a couple other things. So I don't wanna to spend too much time. I know I'm almost late, um, but um, I'm gonna run through a little bit about how this all leads to my passion. So again, I really love TV. I love this story about Star Trek and Nichelle Nichols. Um, I do wish there had been more shows that kind of show design, but for me, there was, right? So I also, I'm a science fi nerd. I love Star Wars. The reason I love it, Leia, badass. Again, my princess, love her. Um, I also really love the environment. Again, that was influenced by movies and TV. So Never Ending Story, which was about, you know, extinction. Um, Fern Gully, if you haven't seen it, is about really the personification of manufacturing evil and, you know, fossil fuels taking over the rest of the world. Um, one of the shows I also loved growing up was Captain Planet. I'm a kid of the 80s and 90s, so that's super significant as well. Um, if you haven't seen The Cosby Show, and I know that, you know, Cosby, Bill Cosby is completely canceled, but Claire Huxtable is not. Um, and she, watching her really taught me to stand in my own and to really to achieve, want to tr try to achieve a career outside of just whatever I thought a career was. I didn't even know what a career was. I, I knew from her, like I, my mom and her, I was like, women work, women work hard, right? Um, but the other thing that was really influential into me actually 
influencing me to become an industrial designer was the movie Big, was watching uh, Tom Hanks process where he would sit down and try to talk through um, different groups, right? Um, to try to figure out how to actually create toys, right? So it was about research. It was about understanding things. That was the first time I really saw that there was a process behind it. It wasn't just throwing stuff. Oh my gosh, yes! Transform into bots. You got a building, transform into building. What? Transform into building? Like, that sounds very interesting. Anyway, um, that is like, honestly, that those scenes, that like the focus groups, him sitting in that boardroom, playing with the prototypes, going back to the drawing board. I was like, I want to do that. Whatever that is, that's what I want to do. And so again, I always knew I wanted to be a designer and ended up being an industrial designer. And the reason I love industrial design is because I feel like, again, it's a power, right? Um, it's strategic problem solving process. It drives innovation. It builds business success and it leads to better quality of life through innovative products, systems, services, and experiences. At its heart, industrial design provides a more optimistic way of looking at the future by reframing problems as opportunities, right? Um, and so one of the ways that I try to mine problems is through TV, but it's also through books. Um, and I think that it's really important for us as designers to look for references outside of just other products. So again, TVs is a way to tell stories and sort of set up situations. Books do the same thing. And I really think science fiction is a, a strong way for us to approach that. Um, so if you haven't read um, Parable of the Silver by Octavia Butler, you must. It's Black History Month. And she is like the godmother of science fiction as far as I'm concerned. She's not really because she started writing this like in the 80s and 90s, but she really is. Um, she, Parable Chronicles are really about this idea of survival, change, and liberation. It's about what we're experiencing now. It's about working with um, an unjust and unequitable world. It's about climate change. It's about corruption. It's about searching for liberation. It's about the future. It is absolutely amazing. Um, but through this, I really understand, I read this book back in the 90s when it first came out and I've reread it a couple of times since, but it really is about this idea of coming together as a community to solve things and to work together to solve things. And so for me, I feel like my purpose is really about influencing the future through design. And I'm really about teaching future designers. And for me, it's not about the thing. It's not design is a thing. It's about the learning, the more effective, ethical and equitable way to go about designing things. And I want people to be able to reflect on their process. And it's really feeling that there's more to the world than just the product. But however, every single part of that product is important, right? I mean, it's also about making that parallel between the product and the importance of parts there. And then also thinking about how we might have significance as people out in the world. So if we were to think about all the details that we put into designing a beautiful piece of industrial design that goes out into the world, right? Nothing should be unconsidered. And the same thing with the way that we operate. And so for us, I feel like it's really important I'm going to leave, end with a quote from one of my mentors, Billy Pendleton Parker, who is probably the first woman to make me feel welcome when I was at Georgia Tech. She um, died a couple of weeks ago. And so she, um, she's like my second mom. She was like my, my college mom, you know, the one that would hug you when you weren't doing okay and fuss at you when you needed to do something. Um, she had this quote, she had many quotes, she had many BPPisms, um, but her number one was don't strive for success strive for significance. And I think that if we all try to figure out ways that we are significant and the way that the world works, um, we can create a much better world. Um, and then, so with that, I'm sort of closing up, but I do have some stuff that I was gonna share about my work, but I'm not gonna do that because we're out of time, but sort of like my whole takeaway from me in terms of me finding sort of like purpose through passion and purpose through identity um, and purpose through like the love of design is to think about ways that I can use it to sort of empower others um, and engage into a much better world and a much better future. And then the main takeaway that I wanna leave is um, if we, if black women win, win then all women win. <laughs> so that's the other thing that I've learned throughout the course of this stuff. So um, with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and then I'll turn it over to Q and A.
All right. Um, Raja, that was amazing. Thank you so much for sharing a little bit about yourself. And I think what I'm able to gather from what you just presented um, is that as designers and as uh, humans who are going to be shaping our future and going to be designing um, and, and making a better world for our children, uh, we need to not be thinking about design 20, 24 seven. I think we need to go out and get influenced by culture, get influenced by language, get influenced by everything and everyone. Um, and that's gonna help us determine and make us better designers, make us better problem solvers. Um, yeah, I think so. For me, it's not the human centeredness. I think that's too pinpoint. It's society centeredness, and I almost feel like it's openness, right? I that's the all those varying influences are critical. So one of the, my biggest pet peeves when people say that I don't I don't care about politics, <laughs> and people have said this at many points in time over the last couple of years. Right? Oh my gosh, I can't watch this too much politics. Right? If you don't care about it, then you are a victim to it. Yeah. And I hear designers say things like that all the time, like that doesn't concern me. I'm more concerned with this other thing or more concerned with this thing that I'm making. And if we put our blinders on and focus too much on the thing, then we lose sight of everything else. It's the forest for the trees, right? So I think for designers, being attuned to everything will make them better. And I don't mean be a jack of all trades or a jill of all trades. What I mean is, be listening to everything and be looking for influences in everything that you do. Whenever I turn on a TV show, I can't tell you how many clips I pull into like engineering lectures and human factors lectures. I'm talking about like cognitive load and I'm pulling up a clip from Madagascar of the penguins crashing a plane, right? Everything is design. And so you can find influences of everything in design. And so it's not hard to do. And I think culturally, um, as Americans, especially, I'm assuming that most of the audience is American, as Americans, especially, like we, we ignore so much. We think we're so great at everything. And I feel like designers kind of have a little bit of that ego too. So I, I, I really think that uh, being more open to other conversations, pick up a book, <laughs> like, like it's super critical too. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I think Americans have a chip on their shoulders. You know what's worse than Americans? Designers. Um, <laughs> Um, and the reason why I'm saying that is obviously like we're both in education and you can kind of see, you start to see that develop in the students when students are in design school and they feel like design is the whole world and, and it revolves around. But to be honest, um, you know, uh, business is, is how things function. And if you're a designer, you should be really good at speaking other languages and i'm not talking about like russian or spanish i'm talking about business i'm talking about marketing and i'm talking about communication um anthropology learn how to communicate um and that's how your ideas are going to succeed um because you won't be just working with a group of designers you'll be working with a variety of people um so i, I, think, I think that's the same question whenever someone says should i go to grad school and i'm like we already what are you going to go to grad school for and they're like a design i was like Mm -hmm. You already know how to do design. I was yep. like, anything else plus design is what you yep. need to be going to grad school for. Yep, that's absolutely right. You got to find something that is going to um, marry industrial design and it's going to be quite well. Um, and if you can't, then probably don't go to uh, grad school. But we have a couple of questions that are kind of coming in, in here. And the one question is from Anonymous and um, it starts out with the way you speak about industrial design is exactly what I have been looking for my whole career. But I feel like I, I feel like I'm not finding other people in industrial design who follow those ethical rules for design in the professional world. Do you feel like you've seen, like you've seen this slipping of what it is to be an industrial designer? How do you think the work against this what how do you how do you think when how do you think we work against this when we still need jobs but don't want to contribute to design that doesn't make meaningful a meaningful difference okay so i think that this is the question for students for the last 10 15 years okay everybody authority students are very happy to do id however it is i just want to make the thing got it 
most of my students want to see, want to do design for something that they have a thing that they're trying to accomplish some goal. And then design is just the vehicle to get there right so like they, they, they care about healthcare. they could have been a doctor they could have been a biomedical engineer they could have been a chemist they could have been a pharmacist right and they've decided to focus on the device thing but ultimately they're trying to get this thing done um and so that has been incredibly difficult and so i think there's sort of like three ways that i really encourage people to approach it one is that design that is ethical that means that you have to be thinking about the all of the consequences and the intent can be done in any in industry. So whether you're making a toy, making a car, whatever, whatever, right? So if it's the safest, if it's the most efficient, if you're thinking about the materiality and sustainability and all those things, and it's okay if you make money. By the way, that's the other thing that I also want people to understand. It's you don't have to be a starving artist designer in order to make a difference in the world. You can make bank and still do things the right way, right? But the right way is really hard to do. It can sometimes be more expensive. It can be more time intensive. It's going to require you to spend more time on the front end, especially understanding who you're designing for, understanding when people, people throw out the word empathy, they don't, interviewing is an empathy. It, it's about relationships, um, it's about collaboration, and it's about really meaningful steps to do things the right way. So technically, I think that if you're working in, in, in the design industry, you can find like-minded approaches and processes in several different companies. And it's important to designers to inter when they're sitting in an interview to be asking those questions of the company, of the culture. Don't ask if they have a snack bar and a ping pong table. I mean, you, you can ask those questions too, because fun is fun, but you should be asking questions about how they operate, like what their processes are, um, how they work to minimize harm and trauma and the way that they operate, right? So those kinds of um, conversations are super critical. And the thing is, if the company cannot answer that, that's okay, because not everyone thinks about it. The other thing is you can be in an industry that is technically supposed to be a helpful industry, education, healthcare, whatever, whatever, and you can do terrible, terrible, terrible things, right? Um, so there's ways that we can take things that are in, um, so intended to help, but they end up, uh, what's the word, sort of like taking advantage and manipulating situations and creating these power complexes. So don't just think because the industry says that it is helpful that it is, there's still plenty of room for misstep. Um, the other thing is, instead of working for industry and just trying to find a job in either a helpful industry and hoping they're actually doing it the right way or um, trying to you know, figure out a way to make good things, do your own thing, yeah. right? That's the other thing. You, the third thing is always like, just you can make bank and make a job and pay your mortgage and your student loans and then volunteer, give your time back, mentor people, work with an organization that is doing something. Remember design is everywhere. If you care about trash cans, go work for the sanitation department. If you care about you know, trees, go help pick up things, but then think about the processes and how design can help make that better, more influential, can help them raise capital, can help or help them be more organized, can be more strategic, can be more beautiful, right? There's ways that you can influence literally every single thing about the way the world is. So don't feel like, don't, I under, and I understand that sometimes work can be soul crushing and you really want to quit because I know, yes, I get it. Um, that said, you can find that, that path outside of, outside of work. And I think that it's really important for people to try that. Absolutely. Um... And, um, you know, industrial design, you know, you talked about the future and you talked about how you watch Star Trek. Um, I also don't think that a lot of the people here know um, um, Captain Planet because they were born yesterday. <sighs> Get a lot of millennials in here or a lot of whatever they're called now um, who were born in the 2000s. Um, but I, I remember Captain Planet. And, but anyway, uh, industrial design is quite um, 
you know, we're always talking about the future and, and designing, you know, flying cars and really cool, like ridiculous stuff. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with um, TV, like you said, entertainment, movies. I mean, you have Star Wars, you have everything, right? Um, here's a question from Anonymous. And um, do you think that design the big, depicted in science fiction media limit our imagination to innovate? No, I don't. I honest, these are the slides I didn't show. This, the depiction of design or the artifacts of design, I'm not gonna say design because they don't ever really show the process very much. Um, the, these artifacts or these props that exist in um, things have been so influential into getting us where we are today. It is this visioning that has liberated us from like the mundane data. You know the thing, okay, so think about how fast industry has advanced in the last 100 years, 150 years. For millennia, 50,000 years plus, yep. people were doing the same thing, everything by hand, everything slow in small pockets community, never knowing what's going on over there. Now we go to school and work on a TV with, with things that float through the air, right? Mm -hmm. If no one came up with that idea, and visualize it in a way that was compelling, it wasn't gonna inspire that next generation of scientists, engineers, designers to actually try to make it happen. Jules Verne was like, I think we should go underwater. 10 years later, submarines are in World War I. Like literally, like that, that's how things happen. But the story that was told around it really helped convince people that it could be real. So I honestly think that science fiction, and there's tons of science fiction out there, um, and by the way, if you haven't been watching The Expanse, you should. And the season finale that was on last night was kind of, <laughs> I need to talk to somebody about it. But anyway, um, there's so many amazing shows out there mm -hmm. and also historical retellings, right? Um, so you should, oh my, what, yes, what is the red stuff? What is this one? What is this one? Love future bending. I can't see it. What is the red stuff? What is what it says? Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's what, okay. That, okay. I have a question. Lindsay, can we talk after this? You should give me your email. Um, uh, or right. not their whole thing, but you can send it in the Q&A to Hector or something. Yeah. No, I need to talk because last night kind of, and there's no one to talk to because nobody watches the show but me and my husband. But okay, so there's plenty of great science fiction out there, but the best science fiction um, contextualizes it in society. It contextualizes it in politics. It contextualizes it in science. And it really thinks about this. There's a story and a thread of how it got there, what needed to happen to get it there what the implications of it were. And those are the stories that make for a good science fiction stroke. So it's not just the thing that's limiting us from trying to make this thing, it's the thing and it's also the consequences, it's the intentionality, it's the presence of it, and what is the influence on people and the planet once that thing emerges. And you can see evidence of that in a lot of Black Mirror episodes too, where they talk about like social media and how it what happens when it gets out of whack, right? But you kind of have to have these um, almost expository like reimaginings of it that are like outlandish for you to really consider like, oh, if I make this little change now, what does that mean 25, 10, 20, 30, 300 years from now? You know, because we're moving in a direction where things are almost getting out of control. And we can talk about AI or whatever, and the, there's bias built in there, but we really have to be conscientious and intentional about what we're doing today. But I am really excited about where we could be headed. That's, that's, uh, that's, that sounds awesome. I'm very optimistic too. I'm a big fan of tech and I honestly do believe with a lot of the problems that we face as you know our humanity, our, our society, um, that they will be solved by technology and crossing my fingers that that does happen because um, I want to live to be 200 years old. So um, <laughs> that being said, uh, uh, I have one kind of question to start wrapping this up. Um, you're very um, energetic and I, I, I love the, just what you bring uh, um, as an educator. Um, and this is the reason why I went into education. I am literally finally have found someone that I feel can like the, the level of the passion that you have um, 
I've been seeking that in education for quite some time. A lot of educators are very reserved. Um, and uh, I guess the question comes from me. Uh, and the question is, um, how the heck can we change design education? Um, um, because everything that you talked about um, really overlaps with design education. Um, as far as like you, you look at design education in the last 100 years and nothing has really changed. Um, there's people like yourself and other educators that I know that are fighting the good fight and mm -hmm. those students are going to, um, um, they're going to uh, get a fantastic education. But overall, uh, you know, if we step back, it, it's still kind of, you know, slugging away um, as industry evolves very rapidly. Um, okay, so I have, I have some thoughts on this. Obviously, I'm an educator. I've not, so first of all, I, I, I want to say two things. I agree that design education needs to change. I also think that design skills have to stay strong. I feel like traditionally design schools have mostly been focused on the skills. Mm -hmm. The skills you can master on the YouTube now. Okay, yep. let's just put it out there. Let's just call it what it is. To learn you skills. can learn how to use software and you can learn how to draw. You can learn the mechanics of being a designer anywhere at any point in time in your life. There's mm -hmm. nothing that's stopping you. Do not spend four years of your life learning to do it. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that, but honestly, it's not worth the money. What a good design program is, is it teaches you how to apply it and how to think and how to reflect on why you're doing what you're doing and how it's advantageous and it's going to be powerful in the world and it could be a bad power or it could be a good power and to let you wrestle with that while you're either learning those skills or while you're recombining those things and you're learning the right way to go about it so that's where i feel like design education should be heading is to think about the com more complexity which is harder and design is already pretty freaking hard right um which is harder but to allow students to wrestle with really complicated problems and questions. It's tough, it's tough, it's not easy. Well, I think uh, you and I definitely see eye to eye on this and I love it. And I think um, I think it's our job to really light a fire under other educators and, you know, especially with the pandemic changing, uh, you know, our, our, our industry as far as design education and everything else, um, we have to, um, you know really teach our students how to articulate their ideas so that they can succeed um because ideas are what succeed not a sketch or not a render um so uh thank you so much for those who tuned in thank you uh so much for being a part of our first lens back in 2021 um and uh, this has been recorded and we'll upload this on our YouTube channel and I'll link uh, Raja's um, social media links to uh, when we post it. So uh, yeah, thank you so much and have a wonderful evening, everyone.